Good morning. Welcome everybody. Today is Thursday, October 29th. We are holding our Garden and Country Extension webinar for the University of Arizona, Gila County uh, Cooperative Extension. Today I've got Carl Melford with us. He's the Gila County Emergency Services Manager. Um, he's gonna be talking about wildfire mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery from his office's point of view and, and what, what we've got going on here. I just got a message in here from somebody named, from Jen, who's working on her dissertation and looking forward to seeing what types of connections she might be able to make. So um, feel free to use the chat box for any type of questions as well as the Q&A. When Carl gets done with his presentation, we'll start opening those up for conversation. And sometimes I'm able to um, actually link a person in here so we can get you to talk, just make it interactive. So my next slide here, just wanna tell you a little bit about these webinars in case it's your first time. Uh, this is a weekly Zoom webinar series. They are 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11 in Arizona. So uh, when the daylight savings comes along here in a few days, um, we stay at 11 o'clock in Arizona. So please adjust if you're from out of state. We feature a variety of horticultural and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County. A recording will be posted to this uh, website, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila. We also have a University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. And this all gets put onto that YouTube channel as well. I guess I'll be sharing that with you guys at some point too. And I just want to remind everybody that the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. I want to take advantage of this moment to just share a special event that we have coming up. I want to encourage everybody to please join us. It is the Cobra Valley Watershed Forum. It will be on November 12, which is a Thursday, so it will take the place of our, my usual webinar, November 12 and 13. It'll run from nine to noon each day. I'm partnering with uh, the Cobra Valley Watershed Partnership and the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Arizona. All these other college, um, participants locally who work with us on it will be talking a lot about wildland fire. Um, our keynote speaker is gonna talk about the role of wildland fire and some of the changing fire regimes in the community. And we're gonna be talking about what it means to be a fire adapted community. Uh, we'll have some panel discussions and breakout rooms, so we'll be making this very interactive. The website's right here, if you can see that, wrrc.arizona.edu, Cobra Valley Water 2020. I've got that in the chat box right now. Um, it, we do require a pre-registration on this so we can do all the breakout stuff. So hopefully you can join us and we can answer any more of the questions on that. Here's our agenda for today. Thank you everybody for joining us at uh, 11 o'clock here. My name is Chris Jones. I'm your moderator. I'm the Gila County Cooperative Extension Agent for the University of Arizona. Our presenter today is Carl Melford, who will talk about wildfire mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. When Carl finishes up, we'll have a Q&A discussion and we'll seek to wrap up by noon here. Here's our presenter. Carl Melford, Gila County Emergency Manager. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna stop the share here. Carl, you can take it over and, and it's all yours. All righty, thank you, Chris. Um, first off, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, thank you and thank you to everybody attending who's uh, interested in this line of work. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here speaking with you guys. Um, Again, my name is Carl Melford. I'm the emergency manager for Gila County, Arizona. Um, our emergency management department uh, here in Gila County falls under the health department. So I report to the health department director. Um, for those that don't really know what emergency management is, uh, that, that is my purpose for being here today, is to kind of break down the, the role uh, emergency management plays in wildfire season. Um, a little background on me. Uh, I've been living in Globe since I was five years old. I graduated from Globe High School in 2008. Um, shortly after graduating high school, I started a public safety career by working in the Gila County Jail as a detention officer. Uh, within six months of working in the Gila County Jail, I promoted to classification specialist. 
I took a particular interest in planning. Um, I've always been what I call a preparedness nerd. Um, I've, I've had evacuation plans and everything for my home since I was, I was very young. Um, so one of the first projects I took on working at the jail was I was looking through old files and I had found a, an evacuation plan from the 80s. And it was the most recent evacuation plan for the jail. So I, uh, I plucked that thing off the shelf, knocked the dust off of it, and uh, did my best to revamp it with the changes in, in the jail and, and policies and procedures. And uh, I actually took that plan and forwarded it up to the jail commander and the plan got approved. So I was real happy to say I wrote my first evacuation plan at 18 years old. Um, I worked with the Healy County Jail until I turned 21. Uh, I was hired by the Globe Police Department, um, attended Southern Arizona Law Enforcement Training Center in Tucson, uh, graduated. I worked for Globe Police Department for five years. Uh, during that time, again, I found my niche in preparedness. I liked to get involved in different community groups and uh, assist with planning events such as the Light Parade uh, and any other public events to try to um, make them work in a more organized and, and safe fashion. Um, I, I didn't know much about emergency management at the time, other than what I had learned from uh, NIMS, ICS courses, but it, it's always something that fascinated me. And it just happened to be by chance that one day I was having lunch at Subway and uh, I met with the emergency manager at the time, Todd Whitney. Uh, he and I just kind of hit it off talking and everything. and. Uh, he eventually recruited me into jumping into emergency management. Um, came into this field really not knowing uh, what it was about. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, I came from a line of work where, you know, everybody had the same job and did the same things the same exact way. And there was always an A to Z policy on how to do that properly. Um, emergency management is, is a problem solving job. So I came into this and you know, was given a problem and I asked, okay, well, what do I do? And the answer was figure it out. And I liked that. I, I liked that, uh, that problem solving portion of the job. And I really, I really feel like I've found myself uh, somewhere that I'm very uh, comfortable and my skill set applies well here. Um, so what is emergency management? A lot of, a lot of folks hear about FEMA. Uh, FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, they are the federal branch of emergency management. If you come down to the state level, there's uh, what's known as AZDEMA, that's Arizona Department of Emergency and Military Affairs. Um, they have an emergency management branch within that uh, department, uh, who is our state agency. And then uh, typically each county has either an emergency management department or office, uh, depending on the size of the county. And some of your larger counties, Maricopa, Coconino, have, uh, a, an entire department dedicated to emergency management. Here in Gila County, emergency management is an office under the health department. Uh, so staffing wise, uh, we are two and a half people. Uh, it's myself as the emergency manager. Uh, Justin Quarles is our emergency management specialist. And Selena Cates is our emergency management and public health emergency preparedness planner. Uh, we, don't, we don't like short titles here in emergency management. Uh, Selena, as our planner, is split between our department and public health emergency preparedness, and she, she is the plan writer. Uh, she's, she's very new in her position, um, but she has had various positions throughout health and emergency management. Um, that planner position, I feel like she is going to excel at, so I'm looking forward to seeing what she produces in that position. Um, what is emergency management? Emergency management is a coordination agency uh, to, that supports public safety and private sector partners. Emergency management is built upon the four principles, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So when I was asked to title this presentation, that made the most sense was to apply what we do in emergency management to the subject of this uh, presentation. So um, I'll go into a little bit of those and, and describe what each of those means to us. Uh, mitigation. Mitigation projects and mitigation as a whole is essentially putting efforts in place to prevent possible emergencies. Um, 
some examples of mitigation would be, you know, prior to post fire flooding, uh, we usually put out a sandbag station where people can pick up sandbags and use them to protect their properties. Um, our public works department will often go in and, uh, and reinforce or clean out the washes to ensure safe passage for water post fire. Um, our forest services will, and uh, AZ State Forestry and other agencies often do uh, projects where they uh, either do fire breaks or, or uh, pile burns or whatever to get the debris out of the forest. Um, on the local level, uh, there's a lot of communities that enforce fire-wise policies and clean up their own yards to, to prevent fire. These are all good examples of mitigation. Uh, preparedness, this would be planning ahead of time, uh, making sure our plans are in order and updated, um, making individual plans for each season. Uh, we do a lot of planning and preparedness prior to each fire season, talking with National Weather Service and the Forest Service and uh, getting an idea of what is to come and what that fire season is going to be like. Uh, response, that is the, the key ticket there. Um, response for emergency management, um, we are a coordination agency. So we support and coordinate for the agencies that are responding. We assist the sheriff's office with evacuations. We coordinate with the incident management teams that are assigned to these fires and provide them whatever they need while also taking the lead on uh, not only evacuation planning, but uh, sheltering. Um, and lastly, recovery. Um, this is actually a very huge part of emergency management is working with the communities to uh, return to a state of normalcy after an emergency. Um, putting people in contact, you know, people who have lost their homes or have had their property damaged, putting them in contact with either uh, grants or, or volunteer organizations or whoever they need to be in touch with to, to recover from what, uh, what fallout they've had from that emergency. Um, perhaps the most uh, useful tool in our emergency management tool belt is our emergency operations center. So the emergency operations center is uh, a, a conference room we have here where in the event of an emergency, we staff it with support staff based off the ICS charts and uh, ICS protocol, NIMS protocol, um, to support our local responders and coordinate with outside agencies or response agencies such as the incident management teams that come in to manage the fires that we have. Um, another key function of emergency management that um, I take personal pride in is our mass notification. Um, I started here in emergency management in 2015 and uh, one of the first things that we did around that era was uh, get on board with Everbridge mass notification system. So historically, uh, the only form of mass notification that Gila County had was the EAS or emergency alerting system. Um, EAS is a great program for uh, broadcasting messages, especially federal and state emergency messages uh, throughout radio and television. Um, the downside to EAS is it can't really be specifically targeted at one area. It uses networks of radio towers to somewhat create a fence where that message can be broadcasted. Um, for stuff like evacuations or area specific messages, it, it, it's not a great program for that because it does have significant bleed over. Everbridge is a web-based mass notification program that people can sign up for. Um, if anyone is interested that's on here for signing up for Everbridge that has not already, I'll plug that. Um, it, you can sign up at uh, readyhela.com backslash Everbridge. Um, and the way Everbridge works is it is a web-based geofencing program. So if you, the user, signs up for Everbridge, you enter an address. And that address puts you as a little pin on my map. Um, you register how you'd like to receive your alerts, whether it be text, phone call, email, cell, and the phone call can come to a cell phone or a landline. Um, 
and in the event of an emergency, I go on that map and I select a geofence. And this can be a very specific geofence. It's not limited by cell phone towers. It is a pinpoint accurate geofence. And everybody within that geofence will receive that alert. I was really excited to, uh, to be a part of bringing this program to Gila County. Um, it, it was very well received. Um, little backstory, uh, when I first started in 2015, um, we started building out the Everbridge system and uh, promoting, putting out flyers. And I think within a year of promotion, uh, we probably only got about 800 people signed up. Uh, I was a little disappointed, but I, I figured, you know, it wasn't going to get gain popularity and gain traction until it actually got used. Um, in 2017, uh, I was promoted to emergency manager, uh, started as uh, emergency management executive assistant. Um, I was promoted initially to interim emergency manager, uh, replacing my predecessor, Todd Whitney. Uh, I think it was two weeks prior to the start of the Pinal fire. Um, so I was promoted to interim emergency manager and bam, we had the Pinal fire. For those of you local to Globe, you know how big of a deal that was for us. Um, about a month later, I was uh, promoted to emergency manager full time. Um, and the Highline fire started immediately after. So I was given a trial by fire. Um, <laughs> It was, a, it was a very interesting first year as emergency manager, having two of the most significant fires at the time for the county. Um, but Everbridge during that time was utilized for some pre-evacuation notices. Um, this was prior to the ready, set, go model that I'll explain later in this presentation. But um, we had some areas that we had to put on standby for evacuation and we used Everbridge and uh, the numbers of registration just jumped up and uh, Today we're in the area of 24,000 registered users on Everbridge. Um, very proud of that number. Uh, it can always be improved, but it, it is, it's come a long way from the very beginning when it started. Um, so again, if you have not registered for Everbridge to receive emergency alerts, please do at readyhela.com backslash Everbridge. Chris, I see you plugged that uh, link directly in there. Um, it doesn't take long to sign up at all and um, you'll be in tune with any emergency messages that are relative to your area. Um, this program also broadcasts uh, weather alerts from the National Weather Service. So if there's thunderstorm warnings or anything like that in your area, you'll get those as well. Um, we do not use this system for anything other than emergency messages. So you're not gonna get you know, advertisements or anything like that. Your information is not shared with anyone. It is an internal system that is managed by us. Um, so your information is safe. Um, the system is used quite often, not only for internal messaging within our department, but also um, through public safety messages, um, weather alerts. So we don't do monthly tests or anything like that because the system is used at least monthly. That doesn't mean that you're going to get a message monthly. You're only getting the messages relative to your area. But um, you won't get hassled with any sort of advertisements or test messages or anything like that. You will sign up and you will only receive emergency messages for your area. Um, another function uh, of emergency management is assisting the sheriff's office with the Ready, Set, Go program and evacuations. For those that don't know, the Ready, Set, Go program was a way to uh, get everybody in the state on board with the same evacuation protocol. Um, in the past, we've you know, used terms like pre-evacuation and evacuation. Um, every county in the state was doing it differently. Um, all the sheriff's offices in the county approved the Ready, Set, Go program. Uh, ready being a state of readiness, you know, to be aware that there's a threat in your area uh, set is pretty much the new pre-evacuation. Set means to, you know, pick up your belongings that you would need in the case of emergency evacuation and have them ready to go. And then go is the evacuation order. Now, evacuation order is a term that I 
have to use, but I don't, I don't necessarily like the term because in Arizona, um, you are not ordered to evacuate. It is highly recommended, but you do have the right to refuse an evacuation order in Arizona. Um, some of the downfalls of that is they will have you sign a waiver and uh, you may not receive another warning for evacuation if it already hits go mode and you refuse to leave. If there's an emergency and you dial 911 and you're in an evacuated area, there is a chance that the risk will be too high for public safety to respond. So you are not in, no longer entitled to emergency services in an evacuation area when you refuse to evacuate. So those are some of the risks that come with refusing an evacuation, but it is a right that you do have in Arizona. So uh, for the next part of the presentation, I'll go into some of the planning portion. Um, the Healy County Office of Emergency Management uh, has several written plans that we support. Um, we have our County Emergency Operations Plan, which is a base plan uh, that covers all of the emergency support functions, any type of emergency, and covers who the responsible party for that emergency would be, as well as supporting agencies. Um, this is a plan that is updated every two years or updated prior to an emergency. Um, this is a plan that uh, is very specific to Gila County. Um, it's very useful. It's the number one tool on my desk uh, during an emergency operations center uh, activation. Uh, the next plan would be the multi-jurisdiction hazard mitigation plan. This plan is a, a uh, mostly a mitigation plan. It's built to list off uh, mitigation projects that Gila County would like to acquire. And the purpose for this plan is when we apply for grants, for mitigation grants, um, if those plans don't include that, pro that mitigation project, we may not qualify for grant funding. So we try to stretch as far and beyond in, in putting mitigation projects into that plan that we may use. Um, it is a five-year plan, so it's updated or rewritten every five years. Um, perhaps the most relevant plan to this, uh, this presentation is a Community Wildfire Protection Plan, or CWPP. Here in Gila County, um, there is a significant difference in the fuel types between Northern Gila County and Southern Gila County. For that reason, we have two separate CWPPs. There's a Northern plan and a Southern plan. Uh, the CWPP is broken down by um, jurisdiction showing the different fire districts, what their risks are, what their plans are. Um, that plan is actually due for a rewrite next year. It's a five-year plan. It was uh, most recently written and uh, rewritten in 2016. So um, if there's anybody here that would like to be a part of that planning process, um, I can put an email down here for you for Selena, our planner. Okay, so that is Selena's email right there. Um, she will be taking the lead on that project. Typically with plans, we hire a contractor that will come in and, and do the legwork of actually writing the plan and drafting the document, making sure it reads, reaches state and federal uh, criteria. Um, having Selena on board as a planner, she's going to be working side by side with this contractor uh, so we can have more of that local input. Um, the two will bring together a planning team that will consist of state and federal agencies, as well as uh, fire jurisdictions that uh, have vested interest into this plan. Um, if there's anybody in this group that uh, has input to provide or would like to be a part of that planning process, please do reach out to Selena and uh, we can lump you in once that, plan that planning team is formed. Um, the more buy-in that we get, the better. We'd like to have as many participants as possible in those planning teams because uh, without input from responders and input from the public and input from uh, community group members, um, we, we don't have enough information to put into that plan unless we have the buy-in. So uh, the more folks we can get on board with there, the better. Um, so for the next part of the presentation, uh, I've talked about how emergency management is involved. I wanna show you what that actually looks like in real time. So what I'm gonna do 
is uh, I have an after action report from the Woodbury fire. I feel like this, uh, this timeline for this specific fire would be the best to present because it was a significant fire before COVID. And uh, so it shows kind of what the normal EOC operations would be like. So let me share my screen here. Okay, so let me pull up that timeline and I will kind of walk you through uh, what happened on the Woodbury fire. And then when we're done with this, I'll share some resources that I use so you can see what I work with here in the EOC. Um, so the name of the event, Gila County Woodbury fire, that has the date and the scope. This fire was 123,875 acres. Um, there's a wildfire. Core capabilities are, are essentially what uh, capabilities we are exercising for this specific event. You can see our listed objectives here, the location of the fire and the participating agencies. So here's the timeline of events and I'll kind of walk you through what I did in response to each of these events. Saturday, June 8th, 2019 through Tuesday, June 18th, 2019. On Saturday, June 8th, 2019, the Woodbury fire was reported to the Tano National Forest Saturday afternoon. The size is about 500 acres. Location of the fire was approximately five miles northwest of Superior burning in the Superstition Wilderness. The Gila County EOC began monitoring phase on Friday, June 14th, 2019. The incident management team held a community meeting on June 16th the Roosevelt Baptist Church located on State Highway 188 in Roosevelt. So when I say that the, the Gila County EOC began monitoring phase, monitoring phase is uh, essentially when, you know, I identify who my EOC staff is going to be, and we're aware that there's a meet, an immediate threat, and we start to monitor that to see when we need to ramp up. Um, I was very familiar with this area for this fire, uh, so I, I kind of knew that it was coming our way, Based off of the terrain, it's a very difficult environment for firefighters. Um, the fuel types are going to definitely move very quickly. Um, Woodbury fire update. So you can see the, the acreage grew significantly and they continued to grow. Um, on June 20th, the EOC was officially opened. So um, the reason we'd open that EOC and call in staff is at, at that point, you know, the fire is affecting our county. We are needing to coordinate resources and coordinate efforts to support the community and our responders. Um, so plans set in motion for sheltering needs. Um, Red Cross is a great partner of ours that we're in contact with for setting up sheltering. Um, and I also contacted DEMA for some support with staffing. Uh, and they're really truly great and will provide additional staff for our EOC. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our emergency management uh, office itself is two and a half employees. Um, during an emergency and EOC activation, I will reach to the health department first to staff my EOC and whatever uh, positions I'm lacking, I'll usually reach out to one of my neighboring counties or the state office of emergency management. So, um, you can kind of read through these yourself on, on how the fire evolved and how the events evolved. This was a pretty significant evacuation. Um, there was animals, livestock, and a lot of things to take into account that were evacuated. Um, another uh, important function of the EOC is the call center. Um, anytime that I need to do evacuations and open a shelter, I make it a point to open a call center. Um, this helps to provide the public with real-time information on where the shelter is and where the evacuations are. Um, the incident management team itself assigned to the fire will have a call center open for answering questions uh, about the fire. And we make sure that that line is drawn there that you know they are answering questions about the fire and our staff answers questions about evacuations. I've seen other areas do it to where uh, the emergency management staff is answering fire related questions and are not qualified to do so. So I make sure that the right people are taking the right phone calls. Um, 
declaration of emergency was pr uh, approved by the Board of Supervisors and submitted to DEMA. So um, the declaration of emergency uh, for us is a good documentation tool, um, especially when it comes to funding. If the county uh, spends too much money to where it's, it, it's a financial drain on us, we can apply for, for uh, funding relief from the state and federal agencies. Um, so this continues to show as the Wood Ferry fire grew um, and kind of came back down with the events that or the actions that were taken by Gila County Emergency Management. So next I want to show you guys some resources that I use. Um, I've pretty much got my, my tab here set up the exact same way that I would in an EOC activation. And a lot of this stuff, you can copy down these links, a lot of these tools, you can sign up for yourself if you're interested. This first program is called Wildfires Near Me. Um, it is a program that's populated by the State Fire Dispatch Center. So uh, each tool here, I, I'll share pros and cons with. Um, this program is quick on notifying me uh, when there is a fire in Gila County. Um, I have it set to where I have two locations here. I have Globe and Payson and I get notified for fires within 60 miles of each. And when a fire starts um, and dispatch records it, it gets populated into this system immediately. The only downside to this system is that fire information that is initially kicked off quickly, but is not maintained quickly. So um, it, it's good for notifying you that a fire exists, but the, uh, the information flow tends to slow down a little bit after that. Um, the next window I'll show you, this is uh, the state emergency management dashboard. Um, this is a great tool. Um, it does also have COVID information in here for both the state of Arizona and worldwide, has weather, flooding, firefighting, emergency management, mass care, and a few other things. Um, this firefighting tool here is fantastic. So um, you can go here to this firefighting tool and expand it. And um, you can actually see, I'll use the, the habanero fire, for example, is there satellite detects heat. I often get calls about this heat right here for most of us from the globe area. You know, this is the mine. So there's a lot of heat there. But uh so you can look at the outline of the habanero fire. And then when you see little heat spots, you can click them and it'll tell you what that is and when it was recorded. So this is a great tool for kind of predicting the path of a fire because you can see if that dot is outside of the fire border, that's the direction that the fire is moving. And this tool stays updated regularly. So this is hugely important for me. This is one of my quickest go-to tools. And uh, here you can see some of the fires that burnt this year. Uh, definitely significant fire activity for this year. Um, the next tool that I'll show you, and I have the Woodbury fire pulled up here as an example because uh, we just covered and went over it. The Woodbury, uh, this, excuse me, this is called NCWeb. So NCWeb is populated by the Forest Service and by incident management teams. So for smaller, less significant fires, it's not regularly used. Once a fire becomes significant, this is the uh, immediate place for information. So they also do post pictures. So you can see some of the fire pictures from the Woodbury fire, and there's quite a few in here. And these fires are taken by the incident management teams and the firefighters, or these pictures, excuse me. So it's really interesting to look through. Um, it also has an interactive map so you can pick and choose which fire you want to look at. Um, another use for, uh, useful tool here for those that are interested in looking at our plans, uh, HealyCountyAZ.gov. If you go to the Document Center and then down to Health and Emergency Management, right here in this column, here are the plans that I discussed earlier, um, especially the CWPPs are here. They're one click away from viewing. And there's a lot of great information in those plans. 
readyhela.com. This is our, uh, our website for Gila County Health and Emergency Management specifically. So this is a great tool to use to keep updated on information. And this is also the main hub to where people can sign up for Everbridge mass notification. Um, but one last thing I wanna go over here um, is some of the uh, post fire flood effects. So again, using the Woodbury fire as an example, um, the Woodbury fire caused some very significant flash flooding. Um, an example that I will give here are a few examples. These are homes in Roosevelt. So this is a, uh, this is Campaign Creek right here. Uh, there was a low water crossing here where the, the street went through the creek. Um, the water came down at such a fast rate that it just absolutely plowed through that low water crossing and escaped on both sides. I have a few pictures here of the effects that it had on a couple of the homes. You can see the water line here is about eight inches up the wall. It did severe damage to this home. Here's another home that the water went almost a foot up the wall. This one was closer to the creek, sat at a slightly lower elevation. And just to kind of give a little perspective, this is that first home there. Um, and it shows, you know, they, they did try their best to sandbag it, but unfortunately this was just too much water. Um, and you can imagine what this would look like inside. Okay, I wish that little thing wouldn't block my X there. There we go. Oops. Okay, so a couple other things I want to show you guys is some other post-fire floods and uh, regular floods. So just to show you what a regular uh, flash flood looks like, this is some footage that I took from uh, Mackey's camp in Miami. Um, this was just a severe rainstorm. No, it was not fire related. And what I want you to look at is kind of the color of the water here. So you can see it's muddy. Um, this was a video early on in the flood. It ended up actually taking out this entire bridge and destroying it, leaving almost nothing left. But uh, this just gives an example of how powerful that water can be. And you can see this is regular flash flooding because there's, you know, you don't have that ashy look to it. Um, and it doesn't have nearly as much debris. And debris is one of the main causes of culvert failures and damage to infrastructure when the water makes its way downstream. Um, so this is a video that I took of Pinal Creek. Um, I want you to look at above and see the clear skies above. There was a rain cloud parked directly on the Pinal fire burn scar. This is a year after the initial fire. And this is what makes flash flooding from post fire so dangerous is there's clear skies ahead of where I was. You can see the difference in the water here. It's pushing a wall of debris. The front half of these floods almost looks like it's completely dry. There's so much debris in there and ash and it's, uh, it's hazardous to roadways, not only because water is hazardous to any roadway, but it's very slick and slimy and uh, people think they can cross it. And luckily there's a car that pulls up in this video that decided not to. But this is extremely dangerous water to try to cross. So I advise anybody to, to please avoid any post fire flood areas. And then this is near the same area shortly after, just to show what that water flow looked like. This is just a little bit upstream of that. All right, so um, that's it for my presentation. I'm gonna throw my contact information up here and then uh, I will pass it back to Chris to host the Q&A. Carl, we really enjoyed that. Um, we've got about 25, maybe up to 30 people at one point. So we've had a good turnout today. While you've been speaking, I've been trying to get a lot of those um, websites onto the, uh, uh, onto the chat. And I'm gonna send out a couple more chats here. I'm gonna cut a, a few more things here. Uh, one, if people would take a moment to open up the webinar evaluation, just let me know 
how we did here. It only takes less than a minute and any type of ideas you have. And Carl's gonna be participating with us in a couple of weeks in this uh, Cobra Valley Water Forum. And so just wanted to provide the registration link that's in the chat box as well. I'm gonna back up here and get to some of the questions that we had. And um, let me see, I'm gonna allow Jen up here. Jen said she's been in emergency services for the past several years. She's working on her dissertation in the same arena, specifically wildfire mitigation to improve evacuation time and efficacy. And she, I hope you got the information you were interested in, and make some ties for, for what you're up to. So, Jen, if you can unmute, I'll let you comment, or I'll move on to the next um, speaker. Next question. Okay. Um, oh, it looks like she messages that she does not have a mic. So, um, okay. Jen, uh, I posted my contact information uh, in the chat there. If you have any questions or anything and you're not able to type them in here or you'd like to discuss further, please reach out. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or help you with whatever I need, can. Wes, I saw you un unmute there for a second. Do you want to ask your question about the long-term retardants? Yeah, uh, if you can hear me, uh, it looks like you can. Um, I just was curious, we're, we're doing a lot of long-term retardants, you know, able to help prevent wildfires, defensible space, uh, roadsides in California. Wondering what Gila County, as well as, you know, thoughts in Arizona are about, you know, wildfire prevention using, you know, some new tools on uh, long-term retardants. Yeah, so I think I, I love the idea of long-term retardants, especially because um, if you look at the history of, of Gila County and our fire seasons, um, the majority are human caused. Um, and the majority of those human caused fires are started by roadsides. So um, I would absolutely love and encourage uh, the use of long-term retardants on our highway roadsides um, during fire season. You should see a lot of people dragging chains or flicking cigarette butts and, and in the prime of fire season, those lighter fuels, they, they spark immediately. And that's where the vast majority of our fires come from. Um, so I would love to see that utilized on our highway infrastructure uh, moving forward. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think encouraging utilities and um, other insurance you know, companies, it all helps protect uh, the more we can. And so any encouragement you and the team can do, uh, we'll, we'll make sure uh, that we're supporting it. Absolutely. Wes, thanks for sharing that. Ashley, I've got you up. Will you add a few comments? I did make a few questions. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Carl. Really um, appreciate hearing and your videos and pictures were, were awesome. So I'm hoping that uh, maybe we could, could borrow some of those and cite you for them. Um, but I was wondering, when you were mentioning that Selena is organizing with a contractor to update the CWPP, um, if the forum on November 13th, which I'm helping to organize, if we couldn't use that as a chance to gather public input, and, and if so, what kind of input would you be looking for at this stage? If you can answer that. Oh, sure. So um, a lot of these plans that our emergency management has done in the past aren't really operationally based. So if, you, if you're a field worker or work in an operational uh, capacity, those plans are kind of hard to understand. Um, I come from an operational background being in law enforcement. I work with mostly operational folks. So I would like to steer those plans in the direction that they are addressed more for the people who are operational. Um, so input from any anyone that would like to see those plans go in a certain direction that makes them more uh, readable for the public. Uh, a useful tool. I want the, I want these plans to be useful. So I'd like to get input from people on, on how we can make these plans more useful. So I'd encourage people to view the plans as they are and recommend any improvements. I mean, I, we are completely open to going a new direction with these plans so that they're actually utilized as a tool and not just a paperweight on a shelf. So um, yeah, I definitely encourage any and all input on what we can do to make those plans more useful. 
That's great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and then one other question I had was, I was curious if you could describe a little bit of the difference between fire risks and the different districts in Southern Gila County. You kind of mentioned that about the CWPP earlier. Um, and in examples of how the fuel types maybe contribute to some of those fire risks? Absolutely. So um, when, when we're talking about human caused fires, um, you see a lot of a lot of times in the desert brush, mostly in southern Gila County, you see just a lot of grass and dry, dry dres uh, desert brush. And these are a lot of times next to highways. And that's where, um, you know, chain sparks, cigarette butts, car fires can cause these fires. Um, with the desert fires, you see typically slightly less effect on the soil uh, post fire but these fires travel quickly and they burn hot. Um, with the fires up, you know, in the mixed conifer and up north, a lot of times you see these started from campers leaving fires unattended or burning during fire restrictions and, and being irresponsible. Um, these fires tend to be visibly more devastating and, uh, but they do travel slower. Um, and post fire, uh, th these these fires burn hotter, so they tend to have more of an effect on the soil. Um, if you look back to the Highline fire, um, which was the direct cause of the uh, the uh, water wheel incident, I actually have a video. If you don't mind, I, I'd like to share that really quick um, of what that fire looked like or that flood looked like. Um, the video I showed before was the Pinal fire, which was mixed conifer and desert brush. Um, and I'd like to show this video where it, it is uh, mostly just conifer. So you can see kind of what the difference looks like. Just a moment here to get that set up. Okay, so this video wasn't taken by me and I apologize for the poor quality, but this was downstream of the Highline fire uh, after its first significant rain. And you'll, you'll see the difference. There, there's similar acreage between the Pinal fire and this fire. And you'll see a definite difference in not only the debris, but the amount of flooding. So this was taken by a group of people exploring down. And again, they thought it was safe. Looking up, there's clear skies above them, but clouds parked over the mountains where the, uh, the Highline fire scar is. So just so you get a perspective of size here, if you try to kind of lock yourself onto some of these little bushes and some of the trees and everything, it'll give you a kind of real example of what that looks like coming down and how dangerous this can be. You can see the people recording the video realize that standing there was probably not the best idea. <laughs> All right, so there you can see just the amount of debris that that fire or that flood was pushing through. This is the base of the creek right here and it's still making its way up. You know, just the beginning of that wall of debris. I mean, it almost looks dry. It's, a, it's an interesting sight to see, but I mean, absolutely terrifying and just definitely gives you a, a better respect for the power that these post-fire floods can bring. Again, keep your eyes on the trees here. You can see that tree up there absolutely just leveled. Yeah, and these, this is just massive, massive flooding that continues for a significant amount of time and just flattens out everything in that wash. And it's even more dangerous when you have overgrowth in washes because it tends to block it off and create a dam and that water has to escape somewhere else. This is what causes flash floodings in some of our communities. Um, so 
overall, when I'm looking at fires, um, that's one of the first things, Ashley, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, that I look at is, you know, is this, is this going to be desert brush or, or mixed conifer? And uh, I, I hope that breakdown kind of helped you decipher between the two and their effects on our communities. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks for showing that video. That is uh, rather breathtaking <laughs> in a bad way. Um, but I, I'm really looking forward to the forum and, and talking about the CWPP more. Um, so th thanks again. Thank you. All right, thanks. Wow, yeah, those are pretty powerful images. Um, as you can see, Jen just commented back that she got your information and um, I bet we'll be hearing from Jen again. That's good. We got a few more minutes for any other questions. As they say in the radio land, we've, we've got an open line. Um, but uh, Carl, since you've been on since 2017, I can imagine you were here when we had the water wheel tragedy. Yes, I was. And uh, were there any changes that came out of that to, to warn people or what, what did we learn from that tragedy? Um, we, we've definitely um, expanded on closures when it comes to downstream washes on, uh, on post-fire areas. More warning signs have been posted. Uh, closures are implemented earlier and uh, cover a wider area post-fire. Um, we, we definitely promoted more uh, Everbridge use um, and, and notification is just, is just the key. I mean, um, and not only that, but awareness. I mean, if you're, if you're in an area um, where there's watershed, if you're exploring creeks or washes or anything like that, I, I just can't stress enough to just please be aware of what is in that area. Um, if you're downstream of a burn scar and there's any sort of weather um, in that area, to please just be cautious and stay away and err on the side of caution. If you're in a wash and you see clouds and there's any thought in your mind that that could be potentially dangerous, follow that gut feeling and stay out. Um, Post-fire flooding is a very real thing and it is very dangerous. Definitely so, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's something we really need to be able to respect and with these wildfires that we're having, the opportunity for these fire, these flash floods are so much worse. Um, uh, Sia asked me about, about this will be sent out later. Uh, what I, I just shared with everybody, the UA Extension YouTube channel. And so that link I have there is dedicated to the garden and country webinars. And so that's, that's the very first place that all these um, webinars get posted to, for, posted to. So please check that out sometime next week, Monday, Tuesday, it should be up. Uh, Okay, well, unless people have more questions, we're going to bring this to a close. Um, and I just want to thank you for your time today, Carl. I'm no going problem. to bring up our, uh, here, here they come. Okay. All right. And so is it, let me bring up my closing slides. Here's Carl again, dressed up. And so I put into the uh, chat box that link for the webinar evaluation. Thank you so much for taking some time to fill that out for me. It really helps me with planning and documenting what we're doing, showing that they, they makes a difference. And I'm excited about next week. We've got Mary Lata, who is the fire ecologist for the Tano National Forest. And she's actually going to be giving a uh, a summary and a report on the Woodbury Fire Ecology Ecology the Woodbury Fire Ecology Report, and so Carl was sharing about that fire um, earlier in the presentation. Uh, she wrote the ecology report on it, and really, look, I'm looking for her to give kind of a summary of what happened, and then we can start talking about some of the um, how can we start dealing with these wildfires. And so, hearing Wes talk about uh, potential for long-term retardants. That's, that was actually news to me, so I'm glad that he brought that up. And we, I look forward to talk, learning more about that. So yeah, please join us next week for Mary. She is also I'm gonna, the uh, keynote speaker. She's gonna build on that at our uh, webinar, our, our water forum on the 12th, 
on, on this role of uh, wild and fire and the changing fire regime around the community. So I'm going to have Mary on twice. So she's, she's my star here. Looking forward to that. Uh, and that is our presentation today. Carl, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and we'll see everybody next week.